Uh, the last speaker for this session is Mr. NDS. Uh, please excuse me if I don't pronounce the name correctly. Mr. Andreas van der Heide. Uh, is the Senior Vice President and General Manager Industrial Cooperation at Saab. Earlier to that, he was President and Chief Executive Officer of the International Council of Swedish Industry. He also has been a founding member of the Sweden India Business Council and its first Secretary General. His uh, topic is glo global cooperation, the Saab Bay. Mr. Andreas. Thank you so much, Director. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, fellow panelists, it's indeed an honor to be here and standing to be able to address such a distinguished audience on a topic of uh, global industrial cooperation. I'm also in a campaign for the MMRCA, but uh, I have chosen a slightly different perspective to my presentation. I will also try to do my best to catch up a bit of time. Okay, this is a picture. Sweden has been at peace for 200 years. This is a picture showing a scene from the Napoleonic War, 1814, when we fought our last battle, uh, forcing Norway, we won that last bat battle, and forced Norway into a union with Sweden that lasted for almost 100 years. And these 200 years of peace has been based on two different cornerstones. The first cornerstone is the independent security policy aiming at being non-aligned in peace and neutral in war. And the second cornerstone is the ability and capability to produce indigenous defense systems to back up that uh, security policy. And it's really in this context you should see Saab. Saab today is a company with, a, as you see here, a very broad product portfolio and also world-leading technology in many different areas. It's also in this context you should see our capability of producing aircraft, civil and military. We have since 1937 produced more than 4,000 aircrafts of 15 different types. But isn't there a contradiction between being at peace for 200 years and being a world leader of defense? And we argue that that is not the case. And I will try to show you a few slides to back up that view. This is Marcus Wallenberg. He was the first chairman of Saab. He's the grandfather of the present chairman with the same name, Marcus Wallenberg. And Saab was founded in 1937 as a strong public-private partnership between the Swedish government and the Wallenberg family. Because the Second World War was approaching and the environment became a bit hostile, we had ordered some fighters from the US, which they did not deliver, and also the UK decided to put a ban on export of war material to Sweden. So we were basically standing there in the middle of the Second World War with no supply, and we had to find a way. And the Swedish government said that the best way to do this is to do it in a public-private partnership with Swedish, Swedish industry. So when the world around us didn't supply, we had to find a way to do it on our own. And in a few years, we developed this need that really sprang out of an emergency into a very sophisticated and successful global company. We have since then been dependent on indigenous capabilities. This was the reality from 1945, when the Second World War ended, until the mid-90s. Sweden here, a long country with long borders, very close to Russia, squeezed in between the NATO on one side and the Warsaw Pact on the other side. And we were basically, at this time, also non-aligned, and uh, our policy was also to be neutral in times of war. So it was really this context from 1945 to the mid-90s that forced us to maintain uh, the capability of develop and produce indigenous developed material to defend our independence. Luckily, and actually as a matter of fact, at one point of view, Sweden today has only 9 million people. But during this era uh, of the Cold War, we had the fourth largest air force in the world. Luckily, the 20 last years or so has redefined the context. 
Today, the environment is stable and quite peaceful. We have no issues with our neighbors. So what we developed to keep us independent is now an asset that we can share with our friends around the world. So we have gone from one dominating, that is the Swedish customer, to a multiple uh, customer relationship with customers all over the world. And we have gone from being Swedish to become a truly international and global company. We have also gone from defending the Swedish borders to defending borders and protecting flows. And these last 20 years or so has really changed Saab. And we are today a truly global company. Last year we had sales in more than 104 countries all over the world. One of the drivers for this, I mean 20 years, that's a quite short period of time, going from, from defending Sweden to being a global player on a global competitive arena. But one of the drivers has really been industrial cooperation and offset. Of course, it goes without saying that our way of doing in industrial cooperation and offset is to meet national policies and laws. We also provide up to 100% or more of the sales contract value, and we try to generate real value back to our customers through business-driven initiative. But we also believe that if, if the B curve, this is where the offset obligation would end, Normally, you would see a trend that, that the supplier are very active, delivering offset here, and then it fades away as the obligation ends. But our philosophy has really been to continue to create growth and add value in the customer countries. Because we really believe that this is something that grows our company. This is what brought us to Australia and what made us stay in Australia. This is also what turned Saab into a South African company after winning the Gripen deal in South Africa. Today we have more than 10% of our employees in South Africa. So one key element is to, as a part of our industrial cooperation strategy, create a long-term local Saab as well as investor group presence. And to stay after closing our obligation. And we can do this, and I think that ma this picture shows why we are unique in the industrial cooperation uh, field, because we are just a small company. Saab is, is a fairly small company, but in a very big group. The investor group of companies containing companies like ABB, Ericsson, AstraZeneca, Electrolux, Stora Enso, Husqvarna, and many more. So we utilize, this is our family, and we try to utilize our family also to create the values in our customer countries. And I will give you a few examples of that as well. One example is Hungary. We had the commitment to deliver 110% of the value of the lease purchase cost for Fortin Gripen aircraft some years ago. In June 2009, seven years, seven years ahead of schedule, all our obligations were fulfilled. And this was not necessarily done because we outsourced or we moved saw production, but we utilized the companies in the group, like Electrolux and Ericsson and also AstraZeneca, to create value in the Hungarian eco economy and to help them shift production to, to Hungary, which also brought big value into to the different group companies as well. So today, more than 10,000 jobs has been created as a result of the Saab commitment. And this has also brought back value to the Swedish economy because we had to find a new base for production for, for instance, Electrolux and their white goods department. So they basically, as a part of our group and based on the Saab obligation, based on the successful purchase of 14 Gripens, moved parts of their production to Hungary. And today, 7% of the Hungarian export steams out of our offset program. South Africa is another example. South Africa, as you know, operates the Gripen Fighter. Uh, in South Africa, we also had a demand to focus on real, strategic, and commercial viable projects. Not just moving a factory, bending some metal, and then after closing obligation, moving out. 
So this was done in close cooperation with the South African government. And focus was on production, but also on assisting the South African government to transform and modernize the South African defense industry. With us, we brought 100, 100 Swedish companies, most of them affiliated in one way or another to the investor group of companies. And recent studies show that we created through that program 80,000 jobs in South Africa. Okay, so what are we then offering for India? I think the key message would be that we are not here to produce the technology of yesterday, but we are really here to, together with you and the Indian industry, develop the technology of tomorrow, because that's really how we see our opportunity here in India. We come here offering you a number of world-leading systems at an affordable price, and uh, that will force us to become a more Indian company. And then we would also, together with Indian companies, look to develop the technology of tomorrow. And we are also, as you know, in negotiations with some of those Indian partners as we speak. So this is my only campaign slide. With the Gripen, for instance, we are offering a total new level of independence. This airplane will be turned into a complete Indian airplane. There will be no restrictions whatsoever on any technology transfer. We will open it all for our Indian customer and Indian uh, partner companies to be a part of. And also, last but not least, I think it's important to, to, to say that we have a long-term view. Some of the other companies in our group, they, ha they came here 100 years ago and they are still here. I think the group companies today would employ more than 200,000 people in India. And we have been here for more than 100 years. And now when Saab, as a member of that family, also come here, our intention is also to stay here and be a part of the Indian economy for at least 100 more years. And as a final remark, we really believe in relationship and we really believe in people. And we have been here now for some year, and we have started to establish those partnerships. And we believe that it's through those partnerships that we will make this happen. So thank you for taking your time. I tried to catch up some time. I think I was successful. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Andreas. We have finished almost 25 minutes ahead of time. So if any questions? My question to you is, what are the Swedish obligations that Saab has for end user verification? That is the first question. The second question is, what is the policy? You know, military hardware is bought for being used in conflict. Should the customer go to a conflict, what is the Swedish policy on Swedish companies for that moment for support? Thank you, Thank you so much. I think that, that most of you would know that Sweden has among the hardest rules and restrictions in the world on, uh, on uh, the arms export, and I think that's what you're referring to, if I get the question right. And of course, all prospects that we follow has to be cleared by the Swedish government on beforehand. And we are not able to even offer if the Swedish government wouldn't have given us the permission to do so. And everything that we are now pursuing here in India has been cleared by the Swedish government and Swe Swedish uh, agencies and the Swedish government. Uh, I think you didn't get my question. My question was, what is the Swedish policy government policy on end user verification. That is the first part. After the supply that delivered, what is the policy on end user verification? Some nations have that. And second question is, military hardware is bought for conflict, for use in conflict. If the customer is involved for some reasons in a conflict with another nation and has to use that hardware, at that time, 
what is the government policy, Swedish government policy, for its companies to support that product? I cannot speak for the Swedish government, but uh, for end user verification, we have very strict rules, of course, and all the things that we are doing has to be okayed by the Swedish parliament according to Swedish law. And when it comes to using the uh, material that we supply in conflict, of course, they are developed and produced to be used in conflict. And I think that the Swedish government, I cannot speak for the Swedish government, but of course we as a company stand committed to any company or any country that uses our equipment. Our equipment, even though Sweden has not been at war for, for more than 200 years, our equipment is daily being used in conflict situations all around the world. Take a product like the AT4, for instance, which is the preferred anti-tank weapon now of the, of the US armed forces in Iraq and Afghanistan. That is being used every day in Afghanistan. It's being used every day in Iraq. And we have no problem whatsoever in, in, in supplying that to the, the US customer. So, I mean, there is no, no restrictions on, on, on the material that we export. Of course, they are meant to be used in, in, in combat, combat situations, and of course, we will stand committed to the customer.